Welcome to Trigonometry. In this course, we're going to be going through the textbook shown here. This is Trigonometry by Liao, Hornsby, Schneider, and Daniels. I'm going to be going through the 11th edition, but you should be able to follow, in general, you should be able to follow along with any edition that's close to this. And so in this video, what I want to do first is just give an overview of what we're going to be covering in this course. Now, what I've found from talking to people is that trigonometry is one of those courses that can really scare the daylights out of people, drive them away from math forever, and even school. Trigonometry can be a course that officially makes somebody dislike math in school. And so what I want to do is I want to address this so that I can hopefully get most of you in the right mindset before you start this course, so that you're really able to wrap your mind around what's going on. And so you don't end up just slamming your book shut and walking away really frustrated. Okay. And so I think the reason why this is such a problematic course for a lot of people is not that it's hard or at least any harder than, you know, algebra or geometry or chemistry or any other course you're taking right now. I think the challenge with trigonometry is that so when you're going through school, most of us, including myself, for any course, we aren't really able to see the big picture of what we're doing, of what we're studying. I think some students are able to grasp the big picture, and that's one of the reasons why they can do really well in school. I personally did well in school, but I wasn't one of those students that just excelled at the top of my class from, from the beginning. And so, but when I look back at high school and, and lower classmen, college years, I think one of the things that makes school challenging is not being able to see that big picture. And by big picture, I just mean, what's the point of what I'm doing, of what I'm studying? Why am I studying this? How could I actually use this in real life? It's hard to get motivated and to just be creative with anything you're learning without this big picture. And trigonometry is about as rough as it gets, I would say, of any subject that I've personally taken in high school or college when it comes to, you know, what in the world are we talking about? Why are we studying this? What is the purpose of this? Maybe I could, you know, try and visualize what I'm studying, like in chemistry, put a picture to what I'm doing. You can't really do that in trigonometry. It's not that easy. Now, in light of this, in, in the previous video, I talked about why trigonometry is so important, because in engineering, science, in, in all of science, it's very important. However, if you're in high school or, or just starting out in college and you're taking trigonometry for the first time, you can watch that video, but I don't think it's really going to truly click to where like you see the light and realize, wow, this really is that fundamental to, you know, everything Einstein developed, all the math he did, great scientists, researchers, engineers. Okay. And so because of that, here's how I would suggest that you approach this course, the mindset that you need to get into coming into this course. So in school and even in life, there's going to be situations where you're just going to have to pretty much memorize. And what, what I mean by memorize is that, you know, it, it's, there's a lot of subjects, what you're always memorizing to some degree, but there's a lot of most subjects, you can kind of mentally picture what's happening. You can kind of creatively think through what's going on. So you, you naturally absorb a lot of it. But in, in trigonometry, that, that's very little is going to be like that. But all of it is still very important. So just come into this realizing that these are just going to be a bunch of concepts that I need to sear into my brain. But, you know, it, it's not just that you need to memorize, but it seems so boring and pointless. As you might have heard, with trigonometry, we're, we're pretty much just studying only right triangles. And to me, that's another reason why this scares so many people away from math and school. This is going to be an entire book, an entire semester, an entire or, or, you know, year in high school where we're pretty much just studying right triangles. That seems insane. You're going to be memorizing a bunch of stuff about right that are related to right triangles. It seems insane. Not about all of the different types of triangles, which even then would be boring, just studying triangles, but just right triangles, sines, cosines, tangents, cosecants, 
these crazy words, they're about just a right triangle. That's what I'm memorizing. You just have to trust me that, yes, on the surface, it seems very boring and pointless. But I guarantee you, once you get further along in school, in engineering, physics, business, whatever, you're going to look back and, and, and say, of course, now I get it. That's how you need to approach trigonometry. I mean, you could technically make that argument about any subject you study in, in high school or whatnot, but no, trigonometry is, is different, though. What we're going to learn in this course are, are really things that will follow you all through college and, and grad school if, if you go to grad school. Okay, so let's take a look at the concepts that we're going to talk about in this course. We start out by reviewing some concepts from geometry, like, you know, okay, so what is the exact definition of an angle and some other basic geometry concepts. But then we start trigonometry by being introduced to the trigonometric functions, sine, cosine, tangent, secant, cosecant, cotangent. And these are just definitions that allow us to, you could say, you know, have full control of any right triangle. So if we have, you know, like a side length of a right triangle and we know, let's say, this angle or even this angle, then if, if we know the sine of this angle or the cosine of this angle or, or, you know, the tangent of this angle or whatever, we can get any other side length. The trigonometric functions uh, allow us to go between angle and side length, et cetera, for any kind of right triangle. You know, so like it just here that this would go, this angle would go, could go from zero to 90. Or, you know, at 90, it wouldn't be a right triangle anymore. It would be, or at zero, it wouldn't be. So just if from this perspective, anything with this theta, anything between zero and 90, you know, we've got a right triangle. But anything above like, 90, then you've got like a right triangle over here, you know. And, and so in chapter two, what we're going to look at is you can imagine these trig functions, the domains of these trig functions, the allowable inputs aren't going to be restricted to just like something between zero and 90. You'll be able, you'll be able to input any angle from zero to 360 degrees or even, you know, more than 360, you can think about, or like a negative angle, like negative 30. But what does that mean, though, right? I guess if you're above 90, it's kind of like you've gone to a, a right triangle like this. So are we talking about like this angle? But I mean, you know, the angle we're inputting would be this entire angle. It would be like 100 something, right? Like, we're thinking about the sign of this obtuse angle. Not, not, it's not an acute angle. But you know, but what does all that mean? What does the sine of an angle that's not acute mean? What does the sine of a negative angle mean, or the cosine of a negative angle? Or like this kind of an angle, right? This angle, what, what, what does that mean? I mean, here you can think about a right triangle like this, or, you know, like this. So, you know, we need to understand the full context of, of these, these trig functions. Okay, and the main tool that's used to really get the to understand the full range of trig functions you know outside of just thinking about a right triangle where the angle can you know goes from you know between zero and 90 is with the unit circle we're going to study the unit circle this is where you really get the the full definition of, of these of, of trig functions with the unit circle, you can think about what does like a negative angle mean into a trig function? An obtuse angle or like even an angle that's greater than 180. It's not even obtuse really, right? It's, it, you know, how, how do you think about that? How does that relate to like the, the right triangles though? How does an angle like the sine of an angle or the cosine of an angle of 212 degrees, what does that mean and, and how does that relate to a right triangle? That's what we're going to, the unit circle is going to going to allow us to see. Now, we're also in this chapter, we're going to talk about radians. So this is a measure of an angle. Instead of degrees, you, you can represent an angle in radi as radians, in radians. And when you get to college and, and in physics, engineering, etc., you're going to end up using radians the vast majority of the time instead of degrees. And one of the things that radians 
really allows you to do is so with trig functions using radians with trig functions you can model circular motion or anything circular and you can think about this we're going to talk in more detail about this later but the idea is if you have a unit circle so the radius of this circle is one then if you move an angle theta in radian in, in radians then with the unit circle the distance you've traveled along this arc this s distance theta is equal to s and so but it's not like with degrees you couldn't come up, come up with a relation between the angle and the arc length but it just with radians it really lends itself it, it really works well as far as radians it's it's a unitless number so it's a real number you're working with which is you know more ideal in in you know physics and math and whatnot but it also sets up really well with with the, with the relation like this radians sets things up well when it comes to calculus so radians are great but the idea is though you you can see how there's this relate there's going to be this relation between trig functions and something that's circular whether it be circular motion or you know any kind of circular application you can think about using a using trig functions to model that and that's what we're going to talk about okay in chapter four we talk about it, it says graphs of the circular functions and so the circular functions is just they're they're referring to the trig functions but measured in radians and what we want to do is you can the idea is you the the sine function or the cosine function you can it, the input is any angle from you know in radians that's zero to two pi but you can go past two pi or less than you know it's you can go more than once around the circle the unit circle right the unit circle goes from zero to 360 degrees that's zero to two pi in radians but you can think about an angle that's a little bit more than two pi you know you can think about it like that or negative so in general you can input any number into a trig function in general you know in some cases there's you know for some trig functions you can't there's certain numbers you can't input but in general you can input any angle into a trig function any number and you can think about graphing that right on on an xy plane so for example here's what the sine function looks like going all the way from positive to negative infinity cosine looks similar the tangent looks a little bit different but we're going to look at the graphs of all of the trig functions now if you look at the sine function here or the cosine is very similar this is a very famous pattern this is a very this this is a something that's fundamental in nature fundamental for something that's just random and periodic like like so for example if, if you if you took a spring you fixed it at one end and then you pulled the spring and let go or you you know even some of those door stoppers are like springs so if you pulled it and then let go it starts to like oscillate right it's like this naturally random motion it, well if you actually like tracked the position of the oscillation of the spring with respect to time it's going to be what they call sinusoidal like this now like it, yeah it damps out over time but like the the fundamental you, the fundamental function would be something like this and then, and then you you apply adjustments to it if it's like damping out or something so this these heights get a little bit smaller you can make adjustments but the fun the, the fundamental underlying function is this random periodic pattern here okay in chapter five we, we we're going to go through all of the different trig identities and all this is about is so it, it's we're, we're going to be developing all kinds of ways that we can relate trig functions to one another and this is really useful because you know for solving equations in, in calculus and all, in all kinds of situations where you need to you know perform like a you could call it like an algebraic manipulation to solve something to rearrange something to figure something out you you want to be able to relate trig functions to one another so you use trig identities a lot in college so we're going to go through the derivation of all of these and work example problems okay in chapter six we're, we're, we talk about inverse trig functions they're calling it circular functions because they're referring to the trig functions with that are in radians but inverse trig functions so like if you you know if we would, we would take sine of, of an angle 
is equal and we get something. But what if we have the sign of something, but we, we want to find out what the angle is, right? We, we've got the, like, okay, sine of theta is equal to y, but let's say we have y and we want to find theta. So we're going to do the inverse. And so we're going to talk about these inverses. Right. Also trigonometric equations. So equations with trig functions. How do we solve those? OK, in chapter seven, we talk about applications of trigonometry and then they're going to we're going to go into vectors, just some basics on vectors. We might skip this. I've got a full video on vectors, a separate video. OK, and then the final chapter, it's complex numbers, polar equations and parametric equations. So, yeah, with with complex numbers, imaginary numbers, there's like a, a parallel between the way that we, the, the unit circle, the way that we, you know, once you understand how to, how, how to operate with the unit circle, then there's a way of looking at complex numbers a, a similar way that's just like that. And so that's really interesting. This is really interesting for understanding, you know, you, you're going to get a really good look at, at imaginary numbers, complex numbers in chapter eight. And then polar equations come from a, a polar coordinate system, which is set up using trig functions. And then finally, we'll talk about parametric equations. And then that'll be it for trigonometry.